It's time to get going for our um, second plenary um, panel conversation. I'll just, uh, um, most of you heard me um, describe this morning this conference as being one that has a very practical bent. Um, and I heard a comment in one of this afternoon's concurrent sessions that was just like music to my ears. Uh, one of the speakers on one of the concurrent panels um, was presenting her research and she said, one of the great things about this conference is that they asked us to think about the policy implications for our research. And as a researcher, usually I'm just used to writing the paper, delivering it, and handing it off and saying, there you go. Um, but the conference organizers um, asked us to try to wrestle with the question, so what? Um, so I thought that wouldn't be a bad uh, moniker for this conference series. This is the so what um, conference. And I think that um, uh, this afternoon we have an amazing uh, lineup to start shifting gears and talking about the effects of communities, community institutions, and the environment on the development of kids. And so what? Uh, so I'll leave that um, to the five of you. As we did this morning and as we will again with tomorrow's um, last plenary conversation, we've asked our speakers to do a pretty unreasonable thing, which is rather than just present a single paper, for instance, we've asked them to really draw from the, their entire um, body of relevant research um, to talk about what some of the key high-level themes are that they think we need to be thinking about um, based on the research and based on the evidence. Um, and we've given them a very, very short amount of time in which to do so. In fact, on this afternoon's panel, because we have um, one more speaker than we had this morning, um, we've given them even less time. Um, so the longer I talk, the less time uh, they have. Um, so with that, uh, really looking forward to this afternoon's conversation on shaping economic futures, the roles of communities. Um, I'm going to um, turn things over to our moderator. Um, and uh, uh, my good colleague, Erica Pothig, who is the Institute Fellow and Director of Urban Policy Initiatives at the Urban Institute. Erica. Great. Thanks so much, Dave. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, for being here, being uh, interested, invested in uh, this topic. Um, I'm curious, how many folks attended the last Fed Reserve Conference on Economic Mobility? Okay. So you know then, at that conference, Raj Chetty's work, um, Nathan Hendren's work, was a central part of the conversation, certainly not the only, because I think their work supercharged a lot of other scholarly work that f has, over the years, really contributed to our understanding about the role of place, the role of community, in improving the life outcomes of people. Um, this year's conference is about children and those foundations. This conversation we're gonna to have today is about community and context and housing. And we're gonna to try to open up that black box of community and understand what are the ingredients? Why uh, do we see it contributing to um, better outcomes, to enabling children who grow up in low poverty communities to eventually uh, move up the ladder of opportunity much faster than children who don't have that same access. Um, and we have a terrific panel uh, to do that with us today. And let me introduce them. Uh, and then we'll get going so as not to take any more time than necessary from your presentations. Um, so to my right uh, is Dr. Martin sanchez Jankowski uh, from the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, he is a professor of sociology and the director of the Institute for the Study of Societal Issues and also the chair of the Center for Ethnographic Research. Welcome. Thank you for coming from the West Coast. Um, and then to his right is Erin Hardy from Brandeis University, and she's a fellow with Data Diversity, um, Data, DiversityDataKids.org project, um, which is at the Heller School for Social Policy and Management. Welcome, Erin. And to her right is Dr. Sandra Newman uh, from Johns Hopkins University, and uh, Sandy is a professor of policy studies and the director of the Center on Housing, Neighborhoods, and Community. Um, and then to her right is Dr. Rebecca Levine Coley from Boston College. Uh, and she is a professor of applied developmental and educational psychology. So welcome. Um, we are going to uh, start off um, and invite um, Rebecca to first kick us off. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. So fortunately, I'm from Boston, which means I speak really fast. So I think we'll be okay. 
It's a pleasure to be here. Let's see which button we do. OK. So um, I'm going to talk about some of my own and a little bit of other people's recent research trying to understand how the central contexts um, in which children are embedded affect their development through childhood, but also their ability to be economically mobile in adulthood. So if we think about bioecological theory, which is the primary theoretical framework to understand human development within context, there are really two key things to keep in mind. The first is that individuals select into and affect the context that surround them, right? So with greater or lesser amount of choice, we select our neighborhoods, we select our schools, we select whom we marry, right? And then we affect those contacts and the people in those contacts. At the same time, contacts have a, have a substantial effect on how individuals develop through time, through proximal processes, so through ongoing interactions and experiences, opportunities and constraints that we face in the context in which we're embedded. So when we're thinking about children's development, their families, their communities, and their schools are really the key contexts that affect how they function. So I'm sure everyone in this room is aware, at this conference particularly, that income inequality has grown dramatically in America in the past few generations. What's particularly important is that the, the, the inequality has grown because of a particular aspect of the economic strata, and that's basically that wealthy people are sort of moving away from the rest of the distribution. So wealthy people are moving away from the poor, and the well-off are also moving away from the middle class. So the gap is growing dramatically. What I think is a little bit less well-known is that that's having a substantial effect on communities and schools and other contexts as well. So economic segregation has also grown dramatically in the US. That means that wealthy children are likely to go to school, to live in communities, to be friends with other wealthy children. And the same is true for poor children. We're becoming increasingly segregated. Aaron's going to talk a lot about racial segregation. But the biggest shift is we're becoming increasingly segregated economically. So the questions I seek to answer is, how does that shift in economic segregation and inequality affecting children's development? And how are those effects, how do those play out? And how do they differ across the developmental span of childhood? So when we're thinking about how um, economic resources and economic inequality might affect children, there are three primary frameworks to understand this. The first is a resource perspective, right? So money, wealth allows parents to access resources to support children's development. High quality schools, high quality communities, it gives them the time and the energy to provide high quality parenting themselves. The second is a stress perspective. So lower economic resources make people more likely to be exposed to stressful environments, to chaos, to unstable family and community contexts. And thirdly is a norms perspective, right? So the level of resources or advantage supports the creation of cultural capital and social norms that promote healthy development, that promote achievement, and promote success. So in the work I'm going to talk about, I've looked at some of these processes at different developmental time periods to try to understand what are some of the key contextual and community level factors through which income inequality gets passed on to children and, and follows them th into adulthood. So really helps to explain economic mobility. So this first is looking at preschool children. So one of the main sets of policies in the United States We've, we've done a great job of expanding access to preschool programs, but many of these policies target low-income children. That's great. They need help the most. However, many of the policies do that by focusing only on low-income children and concentrating low-income children in preschool programs with other low-income children. So we're creating settings even for very young children with concentrated levels of poverty. And in this work, I've asked whether the, that that phenomena, concentrated level of poverty, affects how preschools function and how they're able to support children's school readiness skills and children's learning development. And what we found in this work is that classrooms with higher concentrations of disadvantage, so more low-income children, higher levels of poverty, we find both lower levels of academic skills among the peers in the classroom, 
and also lower levels of teacher's instructional quality. And in turn, lower peer skills and lower teacher, teacher's instructional quality leads to children in those classrooms learning less through the preschool year. And that follows them into kindergarten. So we found that these shifts follow them into elementary school. So they're entering elementary school less ready for school, in part because of the concentrated poverty in their preschool settings. We've also done some work looking at school-age children, following them from kindergarten up through the middle of elementary school. And in this work, we've been able to pull in um, data and information from census, from pollution, from crime reports, and from really intensive surveys of families to understand, to look at a variety of characteristics of the neighborhoods and of the schools that children are embedded within. And what we found in this work is that family income selects families, this is not completely surprising, but selects families into lower resourced environments, right? So families with lower levels of income are more likely, are less likely to select into, to live into higher advantage neighborhoods, neighborhoods with higher level, uh, higher income, more educated families, families with higher prestige jobs, and that that neighborhood advantage or disadvantage in turn leads to um, higher levels of enriched parenting. So parents who live in more advantaged neighborhoods are more likely to read to their children more often, to stimulate their children, to provide these opportunities for their children in the home context, which in turn helps to support children's academic achievement in elementary school. We've also looked at, we've also found that other neighborhood resources like access to libraries, um, high quality out of school activities are also related to families' income and in turn promote academic achievement. And finally, we found that these levels of um, neighborhood advantage are distinct. They're not just the opposite, the flip side of neighborhood disadvantage. So family income is also associated with the likelihood of living near poor people, people who receive public assistance, people who are unemployed. And living in communities like that is linked to a higher likelihood of using harsh discipline with children, which in turn, again, is associated with lower academic achievement. So we found that these are some of the key contextual factors promoting the success or lack of success of children in school. That's important because children's success in school by third grade is highly predictive of whether they graduate from high school, whether they go to college, and how they function economically as adults. We've also looked at these processes in adolescence and looking at family socioeconomic resources during adolescence and then following youth all the way through age 29 into early adulthood when most of them have finished their education. And here we find that, again, families with higher resources live in higher resource neighborhoods. And the higher resource neighborhoods, in turn, experience lower levels of neighborhood stress. So stress from things like crime, violence, drug use in the neighborhood, and those two factors are promotive of adolescents' likelihood of going to and finishing college from early, by early adulthood. Similarly, higher levels of family socioeconomic resources um, select families into more advantaged schools. And more advantaged schools, in turn, promote higher levels of social norms in schools. So schools where children are more likely to be involved in school activities, have higher achievement expectations, and these in turn promote academic achievement, attainment in adulthood. We've also found that most of these factors are promotive of job success in early adulthood, of young adults' wages, the prestige level of their job, and just their likelihood of being employed. So to summarize, some of these central factors, concentrated advantage and disadvantage, are associated with the resources, the stressors and the social norms in community environments and school environments that help to drive intergenerational transmission of inequality and intergenerational mobility. Um, these function from early childhood up through adolescence and help to promote adult outcomes. Um, so I'm not gonna talk a lot about the so what question, policy implications, because we're really gonna save that um, for the discussion, but I'm happy to talk about then to really go into some of these issues of mobility versus place-based initiatives to support um, these community factors. Thank you.
Sandy. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so there will be themes in my remarks that uh, sound vaguely familiar to what you just heard, but maybe with a slightly different spin. Um, okay, now, what am I pushing here? This one. Okay. Um, so I want to start by setting the context. And um, I want to put on the table the way urban economists think about housing. Because sometimes when we use these words, we're not very explicit. So there is sort of a, a, a kind of theoretical background to how we think about housing. And housing is a bundle of features. It's not just the construction materials or the unit itself, but rather all of the features that the family is purchasing or renting are capitalized into that purchase price and rent. And that includes all of the features of the neighborhood, including the quality of the schools, the crime rate, neighbors, both their demographics and their behaviors, land use regulations, property taxes, whether you're paying them directly as an owner or they're passed along to you as a renter, and importantly, the affordability of the uh, unit, uh, whether it's uh, owned or rented. And this is an important insight that uh, I, I was intrigued by when we found it uh, in the data, and that is that we often separate housing into one cubby and neighborhood into another cubby, but kind of at our own risk because consumers, householders, don't think that way. When we ask uh, uh, people in housing units of various kinds, tell us what you like most about your housing unit, they will answer about the housing unit, but then they'll start bringing up issues of their neighborhood. And when we ask them about their neighborhood, they'll talk about the neighborhood and then start talking about the housing unit. So they think like urban economists. This is a bundle. Um, I want to set the context by uh, talking about what are the current problems in housing and neighborhood. Uh, we can't look at all of them, but uh, pick off just a few. And here I'm using the latest available American Housing Survey data, which is for 2013. And just looking uh, uh, at physical conditions of housing units, crowding, and unaffordability, that is paying more than 30% uh, for your housing costs. And the three columns are for all income groups, uh, a middle column for modest income, that is uh, up to about twice uh, poverty, and then for the poor, at or below poverty. And what you see by looking at this chart is that, yes, the poor always have worse prevalence rates than any other group, but that uh, what is outstanding in this chart is how large the unaffordability problem is, uh, by comparison, how relatively smaller the physical inadequacy problem is. And in fact, about 10% uh, of poor kids living in uh, physically inadequate conditions is about 2 million children. And it feels like that's something uh, within the scale that could be attacked and solved uh, 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 reasonably. Um, in terms of neighborhoods, for whatever reason, um, the uh, maybe somebody knows in the audience, but the American Housing Survey decided it would stop asking questions about uh, crime and schools and noise uh, after 2005. So I want to first show you the 2005 statistics. Uh, again, the three columns, uh, all income groups, uh, the near poor and uh, poor kids. And a couple of takeaways from these neighborhood statistics. First of all, I think there's uh, less variation across the income groups in uh, in these neighborhood uh, uh, features. Um, biggest on uh, crime, but uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, less variation. Uh, a second is that it's not crimes or schools that families with kids uh, complain about most, but rather noise in their neighborhood. Um, so I thought that was a particularly interesting uh, insight. How that has changed, uh, we don't know because we don't have the data for it. Um, what the 2013 uh, AHS does provide are some um, indicators that are closely associated with distressed neighborhoods and perhaps uh, crime in the neighborhood. And here again, you see uh, somewhat less variance across the income groups, uh, and the statistics are relatively modest compared to the unaffordability problem that we saw earlier. So um, these are snapshots. 
a, a quick uh, sort of synopsis of what's happened over time is very interesting uh, cross trajectories. So whereas physical conditions have declined, uh, cut by about half since the 1970s, unaffordability has doubled in terms of the prevalence. So that really is the main problem that we observe uh, for neighborhood problems. You've seen the uh, data problems that we have, higher prevalence among the poor, but we really need further insight across uh, the population of poor children. Um, I'm not going to spend much time on the two uh, what I consider prominent theories because Rebecca has already mentioned them. I have a slightly different spin on them, but by and large they are quite similar. Uh, economic and family stress, uh, where stress is uh, uh, definitely a negative for both the parents because it changes their parenting and that then uh, uh, affects the child. Um, and housing and neighborhoods clearly constitute one package of stressors in the family. And the second is the investment theory. And here the issue is that uh, partly uh, par uh, children's well-being is the result of the investments that their parents make in them. Uh, if the parents are able to invest more, uh, this will uh, enrich the child's uh, experiences. Um, and those with fewer resources, including those who are paying uh, a very large share of their income for housing costs will be less in a position to make these investments. So I want to talk first about uh, some of our uh, research on affordability. I'm going to talk about three, I hope I have time, for three of our recent studies that speak to uh, these uh, uh, two theories. Um, we chose to look at affordability because, as I've pointed out, this really is the main housing problem. And I think there are two plausible ways to look at this. One is the conventional way, which is the higher your uh, housing costs relative to your income, uh, the more uh, this is going to affect your ability to make discretionary uh, investments. Whoops. Um, and then there's a non-conventional view, which says uh, that if a poor family is spending a very low share of its income on housing, um, what is going to result is very poor quality housing in neighborhoods. So if you imagine uh, a graph that shows uh, uh, scores, let's say, for cognitive performance of a child on the y-axis and housing cost burden on the x-axis, you would see an inverted U. And so we've applied these uh, hypotheses to the panel study of income dynamics, which some of you may know, a long-term panel study, and indeed, here's the graph that results with uh, the maximum point right around the 30% of income spent on housing costs, which has been considered for a long time the rule of thumb. The next question is, well, what's the mechanism here? Why did this occur? You know, if you are uh, spending an affordable amount on housing, there's no guarantee that you'll put that additional discretionary expenditure into investments in your child. And so we looked at the consumer expenditure surveys, and. This doesn't look very dramatic, but in fact, what we see here is there is a significant difference uh, in the expenditures of families who are at about 30% of income to housing compared to those spending less and compared to those spending more, uh, with the difference being investments in enrichment uh, experiences and goods and services for their children. I'm racing to get through some other ones. Okay, this is a study of race and assisted housing where um, we've had many uh, class action lawsuits about segregated inner city housing, uh, uh, and uh, we wanted to take a look at how this may have changed over time and, um, and whether we have problems that, that have uh, uh, continued to exist. So the good news from this uh, analysis is that over the decades from 1970 to the 2000s, um, Disparities uh, in the rates of black and white households with children living in public housing, multifamily housing, and vouchers has disappeared. We now have equal probabilities across the type of assisted housing. Uh, but the one persistent difference across the racial groups is in neighborhood quality. Uh, black families in assisted housing much more likely to live in uh, much more distressed neighborhoods. And so, uh, we think this is partly attributable to historical structural factors. Low-income blacks are more likely to live in central cities. They're more likely to apply for assisted housing to public housing authorities in cities, and cities have two or three times the rate of distressed neighborhoods. So proposals for what we do about this, multi-pronged, just like Rebecca's slide, 
uh, both mobility and place-based investments, plus um, using, using uh, policy and the courts and, of course, changes in attitudes to uh, move us beyond this. My time is out. I was going to talk about another study on race and home ownership, uh, uh, but I will have to leave that to another time. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Erin. I'm another fast talker from Boston. Um, my job today is to talk about why and how racial and ethnic equity matters in how we think about the role of communities in shaping our economic future. I'm going to talk about the neighborhood opportunity racial divide. So let's start with a question. Do poor children live in poor neighborhoods? In 2015, roughly a third of poor white children lived in poor neighborhoods. Meanwhile, the vast majority of poor Hispanic and poor black children lived in poor neighborhoods. So the answer to this question is much more likely to be yes if you're a poor Hispanic or a poor black child than if you're a poor white child. How does this divide shape our future? Research is now increasingly solid. Um, decades of descriptive research, more recent experimental research, the neighborhood where a child grows up has a direct influence on her later earnings. Children who grow up in low poverty neighborhoods do better, all else equal. Secondly, children of color, as we all know, represent a large and growing share of our future workforce. So our current working age adults, 38% are people of color. If we look at babies, our future workforce, half are children of color. So we have strong evidence that community is pivotal for low income children's later success. We know that we need as many children as possible to be in communities that help them thrive. But the fastest growing segments of our future workforce are the least likely to live in these communities. So what's driving the opportunity divide? Long-standing, persistent patterns of racial residential segregation means children of different racial and ethnic groups often live apart. I'm showing you maps here for the Milwaukee metro area. The map on your left shows the locations for white children. The map on your right shows the locations for black children. I really don't have to explain the pattern that you see in the map. It speaks for itself. And I can show you a map that looks very similar to this for many, many metropolitan areas in the US. So given the extent to which children are living separately, we asked, is separate equal in terms of neighborhood access, access to neighborhood opportunity? Knowing that the geography of children is systematically patterned by race and ethnicity, we wanted to compare the geography of children with the geography of opportunity. We created something called the Child Opportunity Index to do this. In partnership with uh, colleagues at the Kerwin Institute at Ohio State, we developed a Child Opportunity Index for every neighborhood in the 100 largest metropolitan areas. And the goal was to go beyond using neighborhood poverty rates as a way of describing neighborhoods to try to capture the neighborhood environment as a whole. So we know neighborhoods are multidimensional, they're a complex set of resources, conditions, institutions, and there can be positive factors like safe walkable streets. There can be stressors like crime. The goal was to capture as many of these factors, positive and negative, about children's neighborhood environments. So we created a multi-item index. It has 19 individual indicators that go into it. It includes measures of institutions like the presence of high quality early childhood programs. It has measures of conditions, um, joblessness, foreclosure, vacancies, access to healthy food. The index is race neutral. There are no measures about race in the index. The idea is to get an objective measure of neighborhood environment and then look at where children of different race ethnicities live in relation to this objective measure. And finally, this is a relative measure. So every neighborhood in a metropolitan area gets an index score. Neighborhoods get rank ordered and divided into five categories ranging from very low opportunity up through very high opportunity. When we look across the 100 largest metros, perhaps not unsurprisingly, we find that separate is very much not equal. These are child opportunity maps for the Milwaukee metro area. The map on your left shows that white children are very highly concentrated in the areas of higher opportunity. To orient you, as the colors get darker in the map, the opportunity levels get higher. The map for black children shows really the stark opposite. Um, black children are very highly concentrated in very low opportunity areas in Milwaukee. Again, this is not, Milwaukee is not an outlier. And we find that 
metropolitan areas that are more racially segregated are more unequal, tend to be more unequal in terms of access to opportunity. A common misconception is that this is a, the racial and ethnic divide is explained by income differences that are happening along, happening along racial lines. And that certainly explains a, a good part of it, um, but not all of it. And so here we look at the results controlling for income. So the map on your left shows the share of poor children that are in very low opportunity neighborhoods. And you see 22% um, of poor white children are living in very low opportunity areas. But you see that compares to half or more of poor Hispanic and poor black children. Then the other graph is showing us children who are not poor. Um, and here again, you still see a third of Hispanic and black children who are not poor living in the very lowest opportunity neighborhoods. And just to kind of emphasize the extent of this, those two data points that I circled here, if you compare them, black children who are not poor are more likely to live in the very lowest opportunity neighborhoods than white children who are poor. A final point that's very policy relevant, affordability issues further exacerbate child equity issues. In metropolitan areas, um, the cost of living in a neighborhood in terms of housing and transportation is not always in line with opportunity. So we may expect that higher cost areas have higher levels of opportunity. But in fact, these two things can be out of balance quite frequently. And those imbalances can be good. They can be favorable. This is what we think of as opportunity bargains, places where opportunity is relatively cheap. And those are the green areas. This is a map of Metro Chicago. But the imbalances can be unfavorable as well. The areas shown in red. These are places where cost levels exceed opportunity levels on a relative basis. So the equity question becomes, are there racial and ethnic patterns to who's benefiting from the positive imbalances and who could be potentially harmed by the negative imbalances? And the chart is showing results for Chicago, which are illustrative of results across the 100 largest metros. But we find that white children tend to benefit most from opportunity bargains. And black and Hispanic children tend to be more concentrated in these red neighborhoods, areas where housing and transportation costs may be excessive relative to the level of opportunity that they're getting. What strategies hold the most potential to improve communities in ways that benefit our economic future? Again, we'll talk more in discussion. Um, the research is telling us that strategies that improve opportunities for all low-income children and that are race and ethnicity conscious hold the most potential. So our work, the work of Raj Chetty, the work of others, is converging on this idea that higher levels of segregation and inequality is bad for all low-income children, regardless of their race. It's shrinking the overall economic pie, and no one's benefiting. It's not the case that higher-income kids are doing better as a result of the inequality. So you put all that together, and it suggests that we prioritize strategies that meet this two-part criteria. The natural question that comes up next is, should it be mobility strategies or place strategies? And I think we all know in this room changing place is a very big job, and it's much more likely to be a mosaic of strategies. So we need good research on both. The research on mobility is in a good place. Chetty's recent longitudinal study of the MTO experiment breathed new life into mobility. But it's important to know that for mobility approaches, all we need to know is whether a child who lives in a low poverty neighborhood does better. We don't need to know what it is about that neighborhood that produces those better outcomes. For place approaches, if we're going to go in and change a place, we need to know what to change. So we need to know the active ingredients. And the research is um, still sorting that out. Opportunities and challenges, just quickly. The first four points that I list here that I hope we'll have more time to talk about in discussion, these are all examples of strategies that are going on currently that meet that two-part criteria. They aim to improve things for all low-income children, but they, have, they are race and ethnicity conscious. The last two points I want to end on are more about the data and the research. Um, one is it follows from the point that I just made about active ingredients. We need to continue to push to get high quality research attached to place-based approaches. And that sounds easy, but it's hard for a number of reasons that we can talk about more. And then finally, we need to continue to leverage and protect what has really become this vast data infrastructure um, that's in place now, and it's critical to all of these opportunities, not just from a research perspective, but this policy area in particular, the data and the information is crucial to policy design, policy implementation, and for monitoring progress over time. Um, so I'll end there. I thank you for your time, and I look forward to discussion.
Uh, first, I should uh, introduce uh, my name because it's so strange. Uh, it is not true that I'm a progressive uh, husband who took on his wife's uh, maiden name, and it's not also true that I'm a product of, uh, of a mother and father that is Polish and Spanish. It happens to be that I was uh, Mexican and uh, orphaned, and uh, the good sisters of uh, charity were able to find me a home with a father who happened to be Polish. Um, but uh, I have papers, uh, and I've been here for a long time. Uh, so I just want you to know that. Um, I have the pleasure of, of being the last person uh, talking about something that's actually relatively new to what we've had before, and probably one of the things that I consider to be very, very important, probably the most important thing that we'll discuss, because it's the hardest thing uh, to discuss. Um, the first is that uh, I want to tell you that the data for this is for four studies that I've done over 30 some years, um, and uh, also a number of other studies that have been done in the sociology uh, field. So this will bring sociology in. Our nemesis, for the most part, uh, has to do with what I want to call culture. It's not every culture, it's not ethnic culture, but what it is, is lower class culture. You can call it what you want. We've had uh, lots of debates about it, about the culture of poverty, et cetera, and it was about blaming the victim, and so we swept that aside politically, but it has haunted us every single year afterwards, even though we swept it up, and we can't sweep it under the table anymore. We need to deal with it. And there, I want to start off by saying, uh, this is to talk about how neighborhoods themselves contribute and are a focus of this culture that we're talking about. Because if whether it was African American, Mexican American, Puerto Rican, Cuban, or whatever, they would say, "Here, these are not the people. These are people acting like I act. They're acting different. It's not part of Cuban Mexican culture or African American culture. They're acting a lot different than us." So it's not ethnic culture, it is lower class culture, and it's the one in which we've actually had to worry about the most. We care about thought, we care about action, we talked a lot about rational choice, but we have other things sort of involved that are actually cultural in nature and not rational choice bases. Structure, I want to impress upon you right now, is the umbrella in which we need to know where culture comes from. So structure sets the, the neighborhood, structure sets the arrangements in the neighborhood, but culture underneath is the life that's made within that structure. People make a life for themselves that's meaningful for themselves. And we need to understand that it actually has entities to it. That culture that I'm talking about is essentially leads into the issues of, 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 of values, morals uh, that are terribly important, that we see come out in education that we want to intervene on, and we can't figure out why we're not making steps very well. And I can assure you, you can pour money on money and money, and the return is not going to be as great as what a lot of the other speakers have said. And how do I know this? Because when you're on the front lines, you can see this, and it isn't about the quality of teachers. It isn't about the quality of teachers. And we can talk a lot more about that in, 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 in later. Culture, what is culture? Culture of values, morals, the rights and wrongs. Early childhood, children learn how, what's right and wrong from their parents and people around them. They develop a set of values about what, if they're in poor areas, how to deal with scarcity because that's what they're going to have to deal with. I found two value orientations that are terribly important. There may be more. Some individuals can have both of them, but one will dominate. That is, how do I deal with scarcity? One will be dealing with scarcity by maximizing excitement. The other will deal with scarcity by maximizing security. That is, they won't spend money ever, they, and neither of them are an advantage to being mobile. Neither of them, but they are an advantage to living a life within a structural constraints. And that's what we have to understand. People have to make a meaningful life for themselves. Otherwise, we wouldn't have this discussion because we'd be talking about suicide rates as opposed to actually something else. They'd be so depressed. So what makes this culture that I'm talking about 
in terms of thought and action so difficult for us to deal with? Well, one is we can't measure it very well. And then once we did measure it and we found out people had certain kinds of lower class cultural things, we'd say to them, we'd say to them, how many do they have and how much do they have of them? And when does it become dangerous? That part, by making it a quantitative issue, has, has put up barriers for us to deal with this kind of issue. The other thing is a prejudice in our part. We have always believed wrongly, in my judgment, that poor people are simply middle class people without money. That is just not true. They are different. And you just have, they have a different experience. They've had to live differently and they will take money and they will use money differently than we will. And we may judge it to be not good, not able to get mobile, but they actually don't see it the same way. And they don't see education the same way. Almost all the things that have pervaded us as policy people is to see education in what has become the middle class idea of mobility. But you know, selling education to children at various stations is very, very difficult because they have options. And those options for status with norms associated with them, which has rewards and has uh, and punishments, if you either accept them or not in the community, are things that we actually end up having to deal with. For the long period of time, a lot of scholars in African-American society have thought that African-Americans were rejecting being white in school and not studying. That was the wrong way to look at it. When empirically, when you've seen this, they weren't rejecting white values. They were celebrating the own values from the neighborhood that they had. One of the problems that we have when we come to culture is, 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 is two things. One is that we're asking people to give up something they like. The second is that we're asking them to give it up for something they don't know, just a chance for a material reward. Just remember that. Because when they leave their society, lose their society, and lose the status in that society, they do lose something. So most of you who are involved in policy, it'll be easier for you to give them money, to send resources down here. But what I'm talking about right now which I've had to deal with because I care as much as all of you do, is this area of culture and how to convince them actually at a certain period of time that giving up what they're comfortable with, giving up what they have found meaning in, will have a dividend to pay. Now, we have to know that we need to be in this as a policy issue because culture takes a long time to change. You cannot do it immediately. We know that from ethnic generations, and we can think about that in economic generations. What we care about is not that the poor neighborhood, and what I've shown you here is I want to have a return on here, which I can't, is that culture recreates structure. Culture recreates structure. We've often thought that poor neighborhoods were disorganized. They're not. They reorganize themselves in a structural way that reinforces the cultures that are there. And that's what we have to understand and to know that if we're going to make a move on these areas, if we're going to actually try to change those cultures and move them over, there has to be an incentive to do that. And there has to be time that has to be taken. And we cannot give up on those. We have to be in it for the very long run. Now, I would say one thing to you. What we care about in poor areas Poor areas change. They don't just become more poor and less poor. We've got new people moving in a poor area and moving out. If there are people moving in and out, that's great. What we care, what we care about, because we worry about, are the people who move in and they never move out. And that's what we're concerned with, with this culture that I'm talking about that has been endemic and has continued to move. And that will be challenging us.
uh, that will challenge us to actually create programs, not easy ones, to actually deal with that culture. Thank you. Well, as you can see, uh, the panel has delivered a feast of ideas. Um, and now we're going to shift a little course to apply these research insights into, data, into information that folks who are in practice and in policy can take into their, uh, the work that they do. And Erin, I want to start with you. Um, so in your presentation, uh, your last set of slides, uh, and thank you for giving some of those policies some consideration, you made the point that we need to more rigorously evaluate the place-based approaches um, to improving outcomes because perhaps we haven't invested as much in understanding those approaches as we have in understanding mobility. Um, and one thing I would also just like to um, point out, you know, Raj Chetty used a mobility intervention to understand place, but when pressed to, to answer this question, he'll say, you don't necessarily need a mobility intervention to get the benefit, right, of living in a low poverty community. You can also uh, place housing in those kinds of communities too, right? So that's just important as we understand the research. Um, but you, you noted that one of the challenges, even in that work and in other work, is we don't know and understand the active ingredients um, of what, what place-based approaches might um, mean in terms of having impact. So we may not have the rigorous evidence that we need, but I would invite you to think what you think those ingredients might be uh, based on what we know, and then how can uh, people who are doing this work partner uh, on opportunities to evaluate and understand um, those approaches? Sure, thanks. <clears throat> um, very big question with lots of questions embedded in it and others I'm sure have thoughts on um, where to go based on what we know about active ingredients and, and what we don't know. I'll try to slice off one piece of it. Um, <clears throat> which one of the big questions is, if we're thinking about things in buckets, should we be thinking more about investing in institutions, so community-based institutions, high-quality early childhood programs, education, this has been thematic of the day, um, or is it other community investments, infrastructure, parks, crime, um, social capital related, um, and <clears throat> or both together. And so, I think, you know, I, I do want to say that there is some rigorous research on this. I think there have been rigorous studies of the Harlem Children's Zone and also Montgomery County, Maryland, um, <clears throat> two places that have um, kind of done deep dive efforts to change place and change schools, um, and then try to test sort of the relative influence of the two. Um, different approaches, but a similar end game. <clears throat> and, one thing that we learn in common across those studies is that institutions do matter. Um, what can't be disentangled yet, although I know a lot of this work is going on now with research, um, is it institutions alone that can close gaps, or is it institutions plus neighborhood investments together? Um, and so I think that's, that's the place where there's still some more work to do. In terms of what practitioners can do, I think whether it's a place-based approach or a mobility-based approach, um, attach research. Mm -hmm. um, that sounds easy, but <clears throat> there are at least three reasons I can think that make it challenging. Um, researchers aren't always <clears throat> equipped or eager to do that kind of very, very applied work. Sometimes the incentives um, aren't there if they can't kind of detach from a more academic you know, set of research agenda. Mm -hmm. um, that's a challenge. And then secondly, practitioners aren't always that eager to work with researchers. Um, and finally, funders are, you know, struggling to decide whether to use program dollars for programs or for research. Mm -hmm. So there are models, there are large national foundations. Just one example, and I'm sure there are many, many others. Um, Robert Wood Johnson, I know, has a, a big um, effort to partner practitioners and researchers together. So there are models out there, but it takes engines and commitments from all these different parties. And then the last thing I'll say is that there's tons of data out there, and practitioners in particular, what you can do, use the data, but bring your child outcome data to the data that are out there. We have lots of information about neighborhoods now, rich measures about 
the different pieces in the structure, um, the bottleneck is often combining that with outcome data, especially things that are related to economic mobility, like academic outcomes. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's Great. Sandy, I, you've been in this world uh, a, you know, a considerable amount of time, and you've really contributed to our understanding um, of it. And I'm, I'm curious whether you think our public policy should be prioritizing mobility strategies over place-based approaches, or what's your, where do you land on that question? Well, it, it will come as no surprise to you, because you know me fairly well, that I don't think prioritizing is the way to go. I think it's not either or, it's both and. Mm -hmm. um, with regard to mobility, I wanna make a couple of points, uh, sort of cautionary notes. Um, if we think of uh, people, mobility being a people-oriented strategy, um, I think we're missing one very important people-oriented strategy that I think Martine sort of touched on, and that is human capital development in place. I mean, where is that in our discussion? Um, people are living in a place, and some of the things that they don't have are job development, skill development, a public works program that gets people into work, as we once had. Um, uh, that, I think, has some features that are very attractive, aside from uh, uh, the fact that it, it will ultimately provide access to uh, choices of neighborhoods for families, because that's the goal that we all want to see. Um, and that is, first of all, it, it targets adults. And most of this research has found, to the extent that mobility research finds positive results, it's on children, it's child-oriented. Mm -hmm. Not so great for adults. So this one is targeting adults yeah. in the family. And the other is that it's targeting these all-important family characteristics that really in broad research overwhelm anything that we can say about housing or neighborhood. We know that those are the factors, whether we're talking about education or housing. So I think that's really important on a, a sort of a reality check here. Um, 20 whatever years ago when David Elwood was the assistant secretary at HHS, he made the point that uh, let's be reasonable. You know, we're not going to move tens of millions of poor people out of poor neighborhoods. It's, that's not going to happen. So I think a dose of reality is important. Um, a final point on mobility comes out of some very recent research that some of you may know about by Eric Chin, who's now at the University of Virginia. And what Eric has found is that the mobility programs, of course, because we don't mandate these things, are based on people, families who volunteer mm -hmm. Uh, for programs, whether they're signing up with a public housing authority for a voucher or whatever else. MTO, everyone was a volunteer. The big Chicago uh, demonstration program, all were volunteers. What Chin has done is he's gone back and um, reanalyzed data coming out of the Chicago public housing demolition mm -hmm. uh, program, where families were essentially forced to move. If their building was coming down, they had no choice. So that group included non-volunteers, essentially. It included you know, people who potentially would be volunteers and the non-volunteers. And what he finds is that children across the board, regardless of age, Chetty's results, you had to be young, so this, it didn't, age didn't matter, across gender and so on, benefited from the move, from the demolition. So the takeaway here is, there's something called negative selection among the volunteers. That is, the volunteers are actually the ones who are least likely to benefit from the move on average, and the non-volunteers are the ones who really need this. Mm -hmm. That says to me that place-based is absolutely essential if you're, and human capital development if you're going to target those families who are really um, in yeah. dire need of assistance. Yeah. You know, your point also makes me think about MDRC's evaluation of Jobs Plus initiative, right, which was one of the most significant efforts to marry a human capital job training um, strategy mm -hmm. on the side of public housing alongside rent incentives. And the insight there is the rent incentive turned out to be particularly powerful yes. in advancing mm -hmm. that. And I want to turn to you, Martine, to help us reflect on your really important and uh, provocative discussion about culture and I think help us understand what policymakers at the federal, state, local practitioners would do differently if they um, 
you know, put this understanding of culture more centrally uh, in thinking about the design of policies? Well, first they have to be patient. Uh, if you're asking for behavior changes, you have, you're going to have to be patient. And the best way I can, uh, the best way I can uh, uh, sort of articulate this is that if we, if we were changing the topic right now and I was talking about addiction um, or I was talking about being overweight and, uh, and there are always cultural things around both of those, um, about those, uh, the big issue would be is uh, to establish both incentives on the one hand mm -hmm. for changing of behavior, uh, some punitive things on the others, but some support systems mm -hmm. on the other, and to realize that um, I'm going to that the progress that I'm going to make mm -hmm. on this area because I want to have mm -hmm. a change in policy uh, in in the way that we mm -hmm. behave uh, is going to be slow, mm -hmm. um, and that I need to stay in it for the long time. Now, if I just talk to you about weight, for example, mm -hmm. my wife would be always on the, on the issue of this. Um, it will be a little bit funny, but I'm, I try to be a little bit serious. She would say, Martine, uh, you need to change what you're eating because it's bad for your health. Mm -hmm. So we'll just say this in terms of mobility. Um, and you don't look good. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, <laughs> and so uh, in that, that's a cultural thing. Mm -hmm. I don't look good. Mm -hmm. So that would be the kinds of things that we all around here would talk about in terms of cultural capital. Mm -hmm. And we'd all care about that because we'd say, yeah. you might not get a job, all right? Yeah. But OK, so I'm on the diet. Mm -hmm. So she's going to give me support. So mm -hmm. the government would give me support. She's going uh, she's gonna to put on me on the diet. She's going to buy the food. Mm -hmm. She's going to cook the food. And then all of a sudden, you know, all the time, and, and slowly, I, I look yeah. different. Um, and then all of a sudden she says, Martine, my mom called me and you, you went to my mom's house and you had, you had pig's feet over there, didn't you? And I go, yes, I did, dear. <laughs> and she says, you know that's bad for mm -hmm. you. And uh, you, know, you know that's bad for you and everything else. Now why did you do that after we got a nice meal and everything around home? Because I like it. <laughs> and she said, oh which means that's about the other the government thing. How many times do we have lapses mm -hmm. that we think are okay that we allow? Mm -hmm. And then when do we think it's actually mm -hmm. detrimental for having actually deterred the policy that was in place? Mm -hmm. And just remember that the goal for my wife mm -hmm. and for all of us is essentially when I don't even think about having pig's feet. Mm -hmm. is not even in my mind. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you, it may not be me. Mm -hmm. If my kids, if I said that to my kids, because that's what we are talking about in this class, the next generation, they go, ooh, pig's feet. Mm -hmm. And that's what we want to get mm -hmm. to. That's where we want to get to. <laughs> and the answer is, we didn't make it as far with Martine but we did get the next one. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Rebecca, I'm going to invite you as the child development uh, expert um, uh, on, the, on this panel to ref uh, maybe reflect on that uh, uh -huh. concept or also just reflect on, again, the sort of like these active ingredients um, and from a perspective of people who are designing programs mm -hmm. um, and those who are operating programs. And what, what do we know a bit more about what promotes um, healthy child development in community? Well, I think there's a lot I could respond to in that. I, I think to pick up on some of Martine's comments, I mean, the, the issue of culture in childhood is incredibly powerful. So children, humans, we're tribal beings, right? We want to be part of a tribe. We want to be part of a group. Our identity develops from that. But children are also really very good at, at code switching, as it were. Um, children understand that there are different cultural norms. There are different behavioral expectations. There are different acceptable and unacceptable situ behaviors in different contexts. Um, so they're capable of developing different sets of norms and cultures with contexts that have different expectations, right? So that gives us opportunities 
to say, we need to try to understand the family context. We need to try to understand the neighborhood context. We need to understand the school context. And if you switch just one of those contexts, there's still the possibility of switching children's cultural norms and expectations, at least in that realm, right? Um, but you have to do it in a very thoughtful, thorough manner. So if you look at something like MTO, um, a mobility strategy, and why some of the, the huge constraints and, and challenges in that program. So take up was a huge problem, right? So lots of families, when it push came to shove, they didn't really want to move. They couldn't actually get there to move to a completely different neighborhood with a different culture, with different um, sets of norms, different transportation systems. And also many of the people who moved ended up moving right back. Many of the adolescents who moved ended up going back to their old neighborhoods to hang out with their old friends. So simply offering a, a single opportunity program platform for changing everything in a family's lives is a really, really simplistic um, policy lever, right? So that's one thing to think about. But that, but that also means you can look at some programs that take school-based approaches um, or community-based approaches that have been successful in changing these sort of normative cultural expectations, but it takes a much more comprehensive perspective and set of levers than just this simple, mm -hmm. let's just pluck you up mm -hmm. and put you over here. Um, I think that the second thing I would say about mobility programs is we know that instability is very, very challenging for children. Um, and there's increasing research that shows that residential instability and school instability are both detrimental for children's outcomes. So if we're thinking about moving children to more high resource communities, um, we also have to think about the issues of, of stability. Um, and moving once, it usually doesn't have substantial detrimental effects. Moving multiple times, switching schools multiple times does. And those effects are cumulative over time, particularly in social and emotional realms, research suggests. Um, so I think those are some of the key mm -hmm. developmental issues Great. to think about. So I'm going to give you all a, a few minute warning that we're going to move to Q&A in a few minutes. I have a couple more questions for the panel, but um, get ready and the mics are distributed around the room. So Sandy, I'm just going to ask you um, to weigh in on the issue of home ownership. We are at a Fed conference. Um, this is very much in the domain of uh, the Federal Reserve Bank and, and board and system. Um, and home ownership is often heralded um, uh, for good reason as a critical ingredient uh, for achieving economic mobility, wealth building, but also mobility through the accumulation of, of wealth. Um, but, and also in some research, some uh, less tangible ideas about citizenship. And I'd love you to just reflect on what we know and don't know about home ownership per se but other aspects of that that might be contributing to kids. So I would add another one which has to do with stability, yeah. which um, um, just taking that for a moment, home ownership is touted as a way to uh, improve the stability of households. So this is an area where there really has been quite a bit of research. And if you look at sort of a, a large set of studies, you'll see that home ownership in these studies is associated with positive outcomes for kids across a wide range of domains. But if you dig further in that literature, there's a subset of truly rigorous studies. And in those studies, the findings are much less clear. And among the most rigorous studies, the home ownership effect, so-called, disappears entirely. So there are a bunch of problems in this research. Uh, let me just focus on one which is the selection problem. And the selection problem is, is it home ownership per se, this tenure choice that is the elixir that's making these changes, or is it the families who, or households, or individuals who select into home ownership? And this carries over into the stability issue, which is, is it that more stable-oriented families move into home ownership, or is it that home ownership, in fact, uh, results in stability. And um, when, when we look at this much better set of studies that 
really has done a very good job in trying to sort out the selection factors, including the stability issue, uh, the home ownership effect per se disappears. Um, this is an important finding because if we really want to improve stability among families, home ownership for all of its positives also has a bunch of negatives. It's a great financial responsibility. There are a lot of burdens associated with home ownership, as any homeowner in this room probably knows. Um, and uh, Certainly, there may be other ways of improving stabilities for kids and families than uh, home ownership. Great. Thank you for that. Okay, one last question for the panel. So I start to um, uh, find your way to the mic if you have a question. I'm going to ask folks to give uh, a very quick response to this uh, question each. We are sort of equidistant between Capitol Hill and the White House in a new administration that's still putting its policy agenda uh, forward. And um, I'd love uh, everybody to give uh, one or two sentences about the one thing that you would recommend um, Congress or this new administration do to ensure investments in housing and community improve uh, life outcomes for children. And I'll start with you, Rebecca. Um, this might be kind of an unfair answer, but um, I would say my one thing is to use and support science-based decision-making. Okay. Um, <laughs> that we have to have data, and we have to analyze it. Um, and we have to use actual evidence to decide what's effective and what's not effective. Great, thank you. Uh, ditto for that. Um, beyond that, you know, we all understand that housing assistance programs are not entitlements, and they only help 20 to 25% of needy families. And to cut into that, I think, would be a, a, a great disservice, especially in the face of this huge growth in unaffordability. And housing assistance programs clearly succeed in targeting affordability issues. Um, I think, uh, agree, and also just drawing from this theme of using research, you know, the research is giving us from the racial and ethnic equity perspective, an economic motivation in addition to a social justice motivation for, um, for being race conscious in our policies. Um, and so there's an opportunity there to broaden the narrative to include that economic motivation. And um, this administration in particular um, sort of prides itself on making the economic case. So perhaps there's an opportunity there. Um, and likewise, some of the strategies that I listed about um, policies that, that are race and ethnicity conscious um, and also you know, work on low income children in low income communities um, have a strong market-based component. Things that are going on in very progressive areas throughout the country, it doesn't mean that the government's not involved. There's a very strategic and important role for government, but there's a strong market-based component going on too. So if the government's not so inclined, this administration in particular, to do a more sort of far-reaching government um, approach, in the interim, you know, some of these strategies may, may be reasonable opportunities for them to support. Great, thank you. Martin, last well, word. I guess I'd, I'd, I'd focus in on high schools. I think there's a, mm -hmm. I, I'm very worried about the disconnect between uh, finally getting through high school and mm -hmm. entering the net transition either to the next stage. And I guess I think the disconnect essentially has to do with what we're training high school students mm -hmm. to do and what's needed out there uh, in the job force. And I guess if I were to uh, make a recommendation, I would have them fund a lot more in terms of the counseling services that would connect students who were getting out of high school directly into the job market, not only simply knowing what's out mm -hmm. in the market and what they should be looking for and training them mm -hmm. for it while they're in high school, but in addition to that, one of the things that I, I think has always been missing is a placement office, mm -hmm. an aid uh, in the high schools themselves that helps students aids them in connecting to future employers. Right. I think that disconnect would help everybody, mm -hmm. uh, but it would particularly help the people who are in much poorer right. areas. Thank you for that set of ideas. So please, I invite you to the mics if you have a question or reflection, um, and we will start over here. 
And please introduce yourself, if you would. Um, hi, my name is Matt Singh. I'm with the Low Income Investment Fund. And um, I think, so LIF and CDFIs in general, I think right now are um, kind of grappling with issues of, you know, specifically social justice and equity and the work that we do when we're lending for affordable housing and charter schools and, you know, what have you. Um, and, you know, I'm hearing you talking about these indices, the Child Opportunity Index. Um, I'm wondering, you know, that, is that index in particular kind of ready for use in decision making in either business decisions or policy decisions? Are there other indices or quantitative measures we can use to, um, for instance, evaluate a loan portfolio by like geocoding or um, kind of potential uh, loan prospects? Okay, great. So how, how to use the index in the decision making, especially when an in investment decision making. I'm gonna invite a question over here and then the panel will respond to two questions. Yeah. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I am at the at Case Western Reserve, uh, formerly at the Cleveland Fed. I was going to say at the Cleveland Fed, um, but a few years ago we had a presentation. A um, behavioral psych psychologist talk a little bit about the behavior under stress and under poverty uh, conditions, and um, I think this can inform a little bit this name that we you know, we could switch from culture of poverty to maybe behavior under stress and poverty. He had a nice experiment where he, in a rural village somewhere in Asia, um, he could observe the same individual behaving under both circumstances over the cycle of uh, crops and agriculture. Uh, it was very hard for them to save, so he had um, rational decision-making to do that would seem uh, unheard of um, under s normal circumstances that he had to make under uh, very high levels of stress and poverty and scarcity. So I'm just wondering um, to Dr. Martin Sanchez, um, if, that, if, if we can use now that, you know, that psychology and, and neuroscience allows us to see brain um, behavior under stress and scarcity, if we can use a better word and not go back to this idea of culture of poverty, which um, is, is probably vaguer and, and, and not, okay. not appropriate. So let me, um, uh, let me invite Martin maybe to respond to that first, Aaron, then I'll ask you to um, reflect on the use of the index. I mean, we've known for a long time that there's cultures associated with all kinds of classes, the upper classes, the middle classes, the lower classes. I don't really know why it's so offensive to actually have something in the lower classes. That, that's the first thing I'd say. The first thing is, is that I don't think it's actually denigrating at all. I think it's actually enhancing. We could say the same thing about anything in, this, in, a, in a very stressful situation that cultures actually exist. What are cultures? I tried to describe that. It's not just the pressures, but how you deal with the pressures. And it's not just those. It's not just the immediate responses. It's what, when you had to deal with them and create a society uh, in an, and when you had to deal with people over and over again, you're gonna develop certain kinds of values. They're gonna be shared. You're gonna develop certain kinds of norms so that you can, exp we wouldn't, you and I wouldn't be able to communicate with the others without a certain set of norms that were existing. So they have the same sorts of things. These norms sort of exist. I think the biggest thing for, uh, I would try to get across to you is that it's not denigrating them at all. They would find it actually nothing wrong with that. They, lots of them would actually, and I'll be happy with what they've done as opposed to what they see in the middle class society. That, that becomes really quite clear when you're, when you're down there. Um, I think the best thing is, is that how to work with that um, and how actually to develop that. The, you know, the, I guess the, the biggest thing is, 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 is that stress, one of the things that those of us who have worked and lived in poor communities want to impress upon people who haven't had to live that way is that they're not they're not a war zone in the sense that the, you get in this every day. They're not a war zone like you would get in Beirut. They're not a war zone that you're seeing in Aleppo. They're actually lives. There is danger there. There is shooting there, but it isn't every day. People have to know how to live with that. And it's not that stresses that actually create the culture. What creates the culture is the economic scarcity that's involved. How do you manage and how do I do, uh, interact with you in the same kind of environment in a non-competitive sort of way. Where, and I think that's what I'm trying to get over. And there's lots of positive things that come out of that. 
uh, that, that is useful in a lot of other kinds of areas. I mean, one of the things is it shouldn't be surprising to you that when we watch for our entertainment every Sunday, you know, NFL football, who's on the field? That shouldn't be a surprise to you. It's a very physical world that we like, and it's a very physical world that they live in. So the idea is about physicality, which I'd like to get across, that it's cultural. It isn't that physicality is just in the lower classes. Physicality is dealt with in the middle classes, but it's dealt with differently, just like conflict is in the middle classes and the lower classes. In the lower classes, you're going to see it being physically dominated. In the, upper, in the middle classes, it's not. It can be emotionally dominating. But that's a way in which one is, is there. How, and I'm, what I'm trying to suggest to everybody here is that we can't avoid this. It's not, we don't get in terms of time. We need to have to find ways to work with it. And if we want to change it, we've got to know that that is something that's going to take some time, but it's worth changing. That's what okay. I'd say. Okay, thank you. Um, Aaron? Sure, I can be really quick about the data. Um, so all of the data on the Opportunity Index is available on the diversitydatakids.org website. Um, and we have it for all neighborhoods in the 100 largest metros. We also, for a subset of metros, have um, the affordability and opportunity data together in sort of a story map format. So you can look at um, you know, what's going on for a particular metro area in a more narrative form. But, um, but there are tons of other data sets. Um, so I would encourage you to explore the, the Opportunity Index. There are use cases um, on the website. You can reach out. Um, people are using it in various different ways um, across the country. But I wanted to put in a plug for another website, which is a really interesting effort that was led out of a year ago launch called the White House Opportunity Project. Um, and it was led by the Presidential Innovation Fellows. And our project, amongst many others, participated in it. There's a website, opportunity.census.gov, and it's backed by the Census Bureau. Um, but what was neat about it, it wasn't just the federal government. It wasn't just private foundation-funded projects. It wasn't just the private sector. Those groups all came together and have created this data hub of what we call opportunity indicators. And there's just tons and tons and tons of data on it, including data from private sector, Redfin, Zillow participated. Um, and so I would just urge people to, to go and explore and, and add data to it as well. Um, it's, it's all about getting, getting more um, you know, pulled into that place, and it's not dependent just on one actor, not just the government, not the foundation. So, Great. Thank you for highlighting that. Okay. I'm going to do the same thing, which is I'm going to take two questions here and then ask the panel to respond. And let me invite you first. Thanks. Hi. I'm Tara Johnson. I work for the National Conference of State Legislatures. And Erin, uh, you might have just touched on this, but in terms of the um, data that you have, have you done it statewide, looking at statewide opportunity? Um, and then also, does it overlap with any health data? Um, I work in maternal and child health, and I think it'd be really interesting to see um, the racial and ethnic um, disparities and changes as it relates to health. Okay. Um, and that's for anyone else to answer, too. I know we talked a lot about um, economic uh, pieces here, but I'm very interested in, so in the health data. Integration with health data. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. I just, I, we need a repeat on a website that was mentioned. I had a request over here. Oh, um, Opportunity.census.gov and diversitydatakids.org. Thank you. Um, my name is Valerie. I'm a graduate student studying global health at Northwestern University. And I was just interested in just gaining a little more insight. You had mentioned instability being detrimental to developmental outcomes, I believe. And the thought that came to mind is that we are a very mobile nation. Many people move. Um, in particular, um, I'm a spouse of an active duty member, and on average, um, they move every three years and all over the world. So these kids are experiencing all sorts of different um, environments. So I was just kind of curious about that in addition to just migration, nomadic people, just more of a global perspective on that. Um, displaced populations, refugees. I know it's kind of a loaded question, but just what's, what would be the most effective ways to work with these families? Thank you. Okay, great. Jesus. And then I'll just take another question over here quickly and then, yeah. Uh, in part, I'm hoping, uh, Nathaniel Bork with the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, I'm hoping to follow up a little bit. I don't mean to drag us back to the culture question t too much, but I want to clarify. I take your point that 
you can identify different class cultures uh, and that it's not necessarily pejorative to do so. Uh, but I think that the, the concern that was being raised and that, it, that at least comes to my mind is when culture is pointed to as a primary explanatory factor for poverty. And I'm wondering if you can address that. Okay, great. All right, so we just have a few minutes left, so I wanna try to um, as respond to these questions as quickly as possible. So I think there was first a question about um, health and whether it's in the index, uh, and maybe you could quickly address that. Sure, um, there's tons of documentation online, let me just say, um, to be, so that we can keep it short. There is a domain, there are three domains, education, health and the physical environment, and then social and economic, so there are health indicators um, about the neighborhood in the index. A lot of users um, across the country are actually pairing up health outcome data using the, the neighborhood index as a, you know, children's social determinants of health at the neighborhood level. Um, and also, yes, there are other geographies that it can be recalibrated to states, counties, cities. Um, the metro, however, was an intentional choice um, because that's sort of the geographic level at which we think about you know, housing markets and labor markets and we think about racial and ethnic disparities. But um, there are recalibrations that do occur um, and we work with partners to assess whether that's um, kind of a viable use. So please reach out and yes, that's a, a great use of it. Great, super. Rebecca, I'm gonna ask you to reflect on the instability question and other um, parts. Sure, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that was, if, if you wanna bring in completely different um, situations of, like, of instability, like refugees, I think that becomes a very different conversation. I think if we focus here in the, in the U.S., um, there's evidence that instability, both residential instability and school instability, is associated with lower levels of emotional stability among children, with higher levels of behavior problems, um, with lower levels of social skills and, and social relationships, um, and with lower levels of school success, academic school success, lower grades and achievement. Um, the school effects seem to be relatively short-lived and to dissipate after a couple years. Um, the emotional and behavioral effects seem to be a little bit long last, longer lasting. I think in terms of sort of, you raise the military, and I think the military actually is a really good example of a system that has created has put into place systems to really help people adjust to instability and has created a culture um, and a set of supports and um, networks that really help people adjust to moving so incredibly often. Um, and I think most of our other institutions in the United States haven't done that. I mean, one example is that there's no federal um, school system, right? There's no federal curricula. Almost every other advanced country in the world has a federal curricula. So if you move from one location to another and go to a different school, they'll still be learning the same information. Here, we have no federal curricula. Um, so I think that there are clear gaps in our systems in helping children to adjust to moves. Just a quick footnote. Um, some work by Ann Maston. Uh, shows that makes sense, it's common sense, uh, there are good moves and there are bad moves. I mean, moves that uh, are positively viewed by families that increase opportunities for kid, uh, kids and so on are gonna have a different effect plausibly than moves that are very stressful, uh, deteriorate the quality of the family and the environment and so on and so forth. So those things really need to be taken into account. The only other thing I'd mention is you said we are a mobile society. Well, in the United States, mobility rates have fallen dramatically and I actually think this is a great opportunity for additional research on how things have changed because of that. Okay, so Martina, I would just say we don't have a lot of time, um, and uh, you've clearly opened up a... Yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> let, me just, let me just say, it's a quick answer. There, if, if, if we had 100% employment, this would not be a problem. But the problem is, is that if you, you got these, you got a limited amount of jobs, you want people to compete for, with them. Now, most of this conference is how can we, how can some people who are at the bottom okay. compete better, actually, to get these jobs? So where culture comes in is what role does culture play in impeding that competition actually at that level? That's the way I, I think is best it looked at rather than saying it causes poverty. No, but if you want to get out of it, then you got to compete with some other people in the world for the limited amounts of jobs in there 
what can we do and where does culture play in that in, in, in impeding them? Great, I think that was a really clarifying uh, answer. Okay, please thank, uh, join me in thanking the panel. <laughs> um, and yeah, and Dave Buckholtz is gonna give some direction, I think. Thank you, Erica. Um, what a fantastic conversation, one that can continue um, in the reception. Um, and I'd actually like to ask um, everybody to join me in thanking all of the tre tremendous speakers we've had over the course of the day today.